my favorite Ed Whitney quotes is, the best antidote to hem stitching is to use a one inch flat brush, as we've talked about in detail today. One of the things that Whitney very much disliked was to see students over detail uh, a painting or to move into providing details that were not necessary too early in the painting process. Uh, but luckily for us, there comes a time when we get to move toward the finishing details of a painting and get to use some specialized brushes that uh, somehow seem to give us a, a great deal of satisfaction. I I've talked about the ability to switch out some specialty brushes with our daily driver brushes like the one inch flat to create unique moods or a different feeling, possibly a more contemporary painting. I want to talk now briefly about some detail specialty brushes that I use on occasion when I need them. Always trying not to overuse them, but they certainly can play a big role in successfully completing a painting and getting into some tight spots and creating the shapes that you need. I want to talk about this three-quarter inch Cheap Joe's Angle Shader. It's a brush I use quite often for a number of purposes, but one of the things that it does very well, and this is a nylon brush, one of the things it does very well is to create roof lines for barns and other buildings without doing so in an awkward fashion. You can create roofs and, and roof lines with a one inch flat, but this does a beautiful job of tying in the right angles pretty quickly that you need to simulate roofs, chimneys, buildings in general. So this is a brush I go to toward the end of a painting or when I'm finally ready to put in those details. You can see you can construct a house rather quickly with a Cheap Joe's Angle Shader. One thing it's really nice for is to let you put in those little overhangs that are necessary. Now something's probably missing on that house, but it doesn't look quite right, but you can see just using that angle shader lets me work those angles real efficiently. The other thing that I'll use on occasion when looking at barns, buildings, other structures is a smaller flat brush. Uh, this is a quarter inch legend sable flat brush. These are great for putting in small window frames, anything else that requires a good bit of detailing. You can see I can pretty quickly, even though that's a little too wet, put in some windows on that house with a quarter inch. Now the one thing I will caution you about is using detailed brushes is fun and it's easy to get a little carried away. Do more than you really have to and then all of a sudden the detail starts detracting from the unity of the painting. Uh, someone once said, I think it was Skip Lawrence who said, you know, you can put that cow in the foreground of the pasture, but at some point it may look like spinach between someone's teeth. So it was always another one of my favorite quotes. Let's look at uh, another brush. We've talked about riggers, the Royal Rigger. I'm going to show you another brush, uh, Cheap Joe's Loose Goose, which is a take on the rigger, which was actually a brush designed for the car industry for pinstriping. And this is a squirrel hair. You'll see that it's cut at sort of an unusual angle. Um, and it's great for making trees and branches. And that's why I just er erased my blue color from the brush because I don't want to necessarily use blue for a tree branch. Wasn't thinking about that. Let's get some burnt sienna and a little bit of uh, alizarin. Notice again, I'm holding the brush at the tip and I can just take off 
making some real definitive strokes. And by just tweaking the angle of your wrist a little bit, you can get a nice branch away from the main part of the trunk. Probably one of the greatest assets of this brush is the ability to make those small, fine branches at the very end of the tree limb. So with very short, quick work, you can create trees, branches. The other thing I'll show you is that it has the ability to, uh, I'm getting some really thick paint here, it has the ability to make a pretty broad line if you let it have time to work and flow. And quite a natural looking tree trunk. This is the Loose Goose, number, uh, number five, squirrel hairbrush. Talk a minute about uh, another mop type brush that, I, that uh, I use on occasion. Similar to the quill mop, but it's, it's more of a flat mop. This is a goat hair brush and it's very good for texturing tree, tree uh, leaves. Get some fall color in here. Goat hair uh, is not quite as absorbent very durable and a little rougher hair than squirrel or any of the other natural hairs. It's relatively inexpensive, but you can see with this mop brush, this actually is a, a Windsor Newton, I believe. Uh, I have the ability to come in much like I could do with a sponge, but all of a sudden I've got some nice fall tree color there. Throw in a little more of that red. By pulling the, the brush away quickly from the body of the tree, I get some textured edges. Now you could come back in with your loose goose, pick up a little branch tree color. It's a rather odd looking tree trunk, but we'll go with it. Connect a few in the body of the tree. Another set of brushes, detailing brushes I use quite often are scrubbers, commonly known uh, by the trade name of Fritch Scrubber. And a Fritch Scrubber is, they come in all kinds of tip shapes, round, sort of filbert shaped like this and uh, we've got cheap Joe, a cheap Joe soft scrub here which is a nylon brush. Scrubbers enable me to come back even after pigment has dried and slowly work out and remove color from the paper. I mentioned this several times today but one of the things I encourage you to do when you're trying to lift color, particularly color that's dry, is to not be very aggressive with your brush stroke, just move softly over the top surface of the painting. Use a tissue or paper towel, but give the water time to lift that pigment on its own without you having to do a lot of heavy lifting or scrubbing. And you'll find that you can gently massage that paper back to a very clean, almost white state. Now I believe I used a cobalt blue for this swatch here with a thalo green. Thalo green is a staining color. Cobalt blue doesn't stain as to the degree that thalo does. And you can see that I've lifted that back out with just a slight amount of work, softly moving over the top of the swatch with this Cheap Joe's soft scrubber and lifting out the color. Fritz scrubber works the same way. Uh, if you wanted to put some reflection lines in a pond, for example, Fritz Scrubber is a great way to do that. Another tip, 
you say you say this is a body of water and you're wanting to lift out a wave reflection put down some clear water first and let it sit for 10-15 seconds water is taking the time to loosen the fibers of that paper and loosen the pigment adhering to that paper so it loosens the glue gum qualities of the watercolor a bit and now after you've let the water soak in you can come back and very gently lift out the reflection in that water several times over the top of it if you need to very gently and get it back to almost a white surface you'll be amazed at if you have patience how much color you can lift off a dry watercolor. Patience is definitely the key. I paint dry flies on occasion and uh, one of the things that folks ask me is how do I get those fine hairs on a dark background without using masking fluid. One of the, one of the things I do, I'll take a rigger brush and I'll actually take a razor blade and shave off quite a few of the hairs at the base so that I minimize the number of hair fibers that are in the rigger and then I will put the rigger down on the surface where I want to where I want to fly feather or hair and let it sit for a while and then I'll slowly and gently start working the surface after the water has soaked in and I'll do this several times this is a broader line that I would normally lift out, but you get the idea. Just a back and forth kind of rocking motion very gently. After five or six passes, you'll begin to lift up quite a bit of color and shape. And you can even do so, if you have a, a brush that's razored down much finer than this, I can even create a fishing line, a fishing line from that fly's uh, loop that looks quite accurate and realistic. So there's a few detail brushes that you can chomp at the bit to get to at the end of your painting and have a lot of fun with. Reminder, just don't overdo it.